No, I'll sit on the table, but there's a hole back there. But well, whatever. It's sort of short chair, so. Okay, whatever we'll people. Put short people here. Whatever. I see. Okay. I guess everybody will arrange themselves. So just please find a place where you can be comfortable and sit down. Because uh, we'll be here quite a while. There's uh, chairs over, a couple chairs over here that are not being used, and you can sit on a table or whatever you find convenient. I see, okay. Okay. Okay, I think we have everybody. Th thank you very much for coming. There's a, uh, some stuff here for making name tags, and perhaps at a break or something, if you feel like it, you could make a name tag for yourselves because it'll be harder for us to remember everybody's name. And uh, I hope you're comfortable. We can rearrange this room as the, as the days go by. I uh, thought this was better than being out in a barn or something where there's more room, but it's harder to hear. And that room out there is, uh, if you want children nearby, but you like them to play, they can play out there and they can play in the yard or whatever. It isn't necessary for all the kids to be in here all the time. It's up to you. The, uh, uh, I, I think a lot of our time can be taken by discussion and questions and talking am among one another. And, and I thought this place was small enough that we could all hear each other. The, I'll, I'll give a sort of initial talk and presentation and then uh, we can go from there. The, the reason, I should explain the reason that we uh, invited you to come. We sent out invitations and there were about, Bethany says, about 250 families that replied. And just on the basis of how soon they replied, we selected 20 for each of three weekends to see how this went. We have a, and I, I could explain the reasons we did this. The main reason that our family did it, probably 90% of the reason that we asked you to come was because we wanted to get to know personally more of the people who use our curriculum. It's just us, it's just a personal desire. We uh, uh, meet you on the phone all the time, we talk to people all the time. We don't travel around. Uh, we don't have time because of the other things we do. So we don't go to homeschool fairs. We don't go out in the world very much. And we thought it would be very enjoyable to just meet you. Uh, the uh, other main reason is because I think it's, it's, of course, very helpful for homeschool families to talk to each other and to talk about the ways they homeschool and other things that are of mutual interest. And since probably most or all of you are using or trying to use our curriculum. Uh, this might be especially helpful because we could talk about uh, the difficulties you may have with it and so on. We may, we don't have anything finished now, but we expect sometime in the next year to make another version of the curriculum and uh, to incorporate it in things that we've learned uh, that might be improved to make it easier for people. It probably won't change in any fundamental way but the instructions might change because there you write uh, you write into it things that uh, to tell people how to use it and you forget to say things or you don't say things in quite the right way and so on. So it might be the other 10% of our reason might be to learn things that would be helpful to us in improving what we do. Uh, and I hope that the weekend will be useful to you. I think it I think it can be very useful. The uh, to answer some simple questions that probably would arise in anyone's mind that would come here. We have lived here about 20 years. Uh, there are uh, seven of us, although only six are here now because Zachary's in graduate school at Iowa State University where he's studying chemistry and veterinary medicine. We came here 20 years ago because we uh, were, my wife and I were both scientists. Uh, we worked at the University of California, San Diego, and then in labs at Stanford and Menlo Park, California. I should explain about this recording stuff. Arnold Yacht, uh, has a very nice website in which he sells the curriculum and he answers questions people have and uh, uh, and he also provides software support for the curriculum. 
And he's always looking for things he can put on his internet site that would be helpful to people. And I don't talk about homeschooling very often, but he's, he's made recordings of a couple of talks that I've given on homeschooling, and he's found them useful. He's grabbed little pieces, and they've answered questions people have. So he's going to record at least the things I say for that purpose. He'll probably go through it later and try to find things that answer questions that his, the people on his site notice that they have, uh, if he thinks they're answered better than what he has now. He, I think this, he's got a, uh, an audio mic on me. I don't know whether he can hear you. But if somebody doesn't want themselves recorded, just tell him, uh, and he'll take care of it. Uh, we came here 20 years ago because we had uh, had uh, unusual, unusually successful careers in science for our age, but uh, we didn't like living in the city and didn't like raising our family that way. And we decided we wanted to raise our family in a rural environment on a farm, and we'd do what science we could. So we, my wife and I came here, we started a little laboratory it's taken quite a few years to get it started. It's a good lab. And uh, before the weekend's over, we'll give you a tour. I have the door locked now because there are a lot of children and there are a lot of dangerous things in the lab. So I don't want the danger of some risk of somebody leaking in there and pouring acid on themselves or something. The, uh, uh, th this, this farm consists of about 340 acres. It's a little valley in itself and the surrounding hills, so it's, uh, it's a little valley by itself. And we uh, do several things. Uh, we farm it uh, along with another farm that we have, which provides part of our income. We also publish a newsletter. A uh, friend of mine named Peter Beckman was a, an electrical engineer and scientist. He, was a, he actually was a Czechoslovak refugee from communism. And he escaped to the United States and became a professor at the University of Colorado. And Peter became concerned 25 years ago because he saw the, uh, the d propaganda that was destroying the American nuclear power industry. And since energy is a currency of technology, he was very worried about the destruction of America's energy supplies or potential energy supplies. So he started a newsletter called Access to Energy, in which he tried to educate the public about the uh, uh, the falsehoods that were being used against nuclear power. He and all the other people like him failed, and nuclear power in the United States was stopped. There have been no nu nuclear power plants built for a long time, which is a tragedy, although in other countries they're being built at a high rate. But his newsletter continued and became a sort of uh, an outlet for science for the layman. Uh, Peter died of cancer five years ago, and he asked me to write it after he died, so I've continued it, and, and we publish it here on the farm and send it out, and it's a, a successful little business. We do that. We do our research, which is largely supported by donations, and then we have this homeschool curriculum, which wasn't uh, expected and intended, but has grown into a, a, a sort of an unusually large business for us and is used now by a lot of people. We don't have any employees at all, uh, just the children and I. And uh, there's a lady in Grants Pass that does some record keeping for us, but you won't see any employees because we don't have any. Uh, the, uh, the homeschooling, and many of you know about this, but I'll uh, just summarize briefly before I talk about substance. The homeschooling, um, we started homeschooling, uh, I guess, when Zachary was six. And he's now 23. That was uh, 16 years ago. And we. We were then living, well, we actually, were, we were starting to decide to homeschool, although we hadn't homeschooled until we came here, we've, because we've been here 20. But we decided to homeschool when he was, uh, right after he was first born. I, uh, at that time, we were totally immersed in our research work in medicine. And I wouldn't say that we were as aware of the reasons to homeschool as we are today. But they were still the general reasons that most American homeschoolers have, and that was we didn't want our children exposed to, this, to the environment that's in the public schools. Uh, as time passed, we became aware of the academic environment in the public schools, and that's a disaster too, so it gives a second reason. And academics and sociology are probably the main reasons that people homeschool, and probably the reason that we decided to, uh, primarily the sociological. I'd say that there's a lot more reason, and homeschooling now is not just a, a mechanism, it's a whole giant social movement in the United States. But uh, you know, that's w when we started, and my wife started to collect materials to homeschool with. There was a, uh, a secular uh, method of homeschooling invented by a lady named Mae Carden, and we had a friend that knew about this, 
So she started select getting materials for this Cardin method. The Cardin people had schools you could go to, and Laura Lee took a little time off from her scientific work and went to the school and learned about how to use the Cardin method and all this. There was no uh, Christianity in this method, so she started getting that from the uh, Christian bookstores, getting Sunday school materials and so forth, and melding the two together. Also, those were the days, uh, you may remember, in the, in the uh, uh, late 70s when the economy was going crazy, inflation was 15 or 20 percent, nobody knew whether the dollar would ever buy anything again. So we were also worried that we wouldn't be able to get these materials in the future. So every time we had a child, she had a complete curriculum from Carton, all the workbooks and stuff, because you had to buy it for each child. And we tried to basically buy ahead everything that our family would use for homeschooling with the idea that she'd be a teacher and it would be done in the conventional way. Uh, and then as the children became older, uh, she started teaching them. She had a little blackboard set up right about here and uh, just worked it into her normal affairs. This is an old farmhouse. It's about 100 years old. But when we first came here, we, we uh, uh, repaired the old one, which was sliding off its foundations, and we built this one room onto it. So she used this as her schoolroom and so on. Uh, and was uh, teaching the children in the usual way, using this Cardin thing as the base, which is not that different from Becker or John Bob Jones or any of the others that you would use, except that she had to put the Christianity in it herself. When she died in 1988, uh, Zachary was 12 and Noah was 10, and uh, the tw Aaron was 8, the twins were 6, and Matthew was 16 months old. Back there, if you haven't met them yet, the tallest one is Noah, and then uh, Aaron is uh, right beside him in the bathroom door. And Bethany and Joshua are twins. They're over there. And Matthew is there now. And Zachary's at Iowa State. Also, the bathroom door reminds me, we don't, I, I, you're welcome to use anything that's on the farm. The only thing that we've really locked up is the lab to prevent accidents. Uh, we have a spring that is over there about a third of a mile. It's across the creek and up that hill. And that spring puts out about five gallons a minute of water and comes down. It feeds the water outlets and the bathrooms and the one out in the, uh, out in the driveway and so on. But it doesn't have a holding tank. I, I put in a, a two-inch pipe, and the pipe holds 200 gallons so that it doesn't have a holding tank to get dirty. You just The, pipe, the water is coming out of the spring, down the pipe, into the outlets. So it keeps it cleaner because there's no holding tank, but it only holds 200 gallons. So I know that if we all go in and use the toilet, which you're all welcome to use, any, you know, use the ones in the house even, uh, we'll run out of water very quickly. And it'll take a long time to fill that up again at, at the five gallons a minute. So I got those two things out there that uh, perhaps they would be used, uh, could be used a lot of the time, but especially people with very small children and babies and, and where it's convenient to you, where you need to. Uh, there's a bathroom here, and uh, uh, there's nothing that, uh, that, uh, that you can't try to use, but try not to to flush toilets a lot because uh, pretty soon they won't flush and then everybody will be out of water for a couple hours while the tube fills up again. So uh, at that juncture, uh, the children were uh, at about what, about the normal academic level for that age and uh, didn't have a teacher and there wasn't any prospect of getting one. I. Uh, we were, had a little different mix of work then, but it took all of my time to do my work. And the only uh, thing we had going for us was that I worked here. So I didn't have to go away to work, but we didn't have anybody to be a teacher. And I concluded that uh, it would be, we would be better off. By then, I was much more familiar with the sociological environment in the public schools and the academic level, et cetera. And it was at that point, I considered going to a public school child abuse. I, can, I just wouldn't put my children in the public school. I thought our school would be much less valuable uh, than it had been with a teacher, but it would be better off than going to public school. So uh, we uh, rearranged things. And you can, uh, on a break or something, poke your head in this, this little brown building that's right out here by the as you came in. It was on your left. It's an old woodshed that we had paneled and fixed up, used as an office. And I got uh, six desks, sort of rather large desks, about 2 thirds the size of that table, and put them in there and gave each one of them a desk, except for Matthew. 
So five of them had desks in there, and I had my desk in there, and we just worked together. And I started handing them materials, but not helping them at all, uh, just improvising. Now, Matthew was kept in here because he was 16 months old, and the five children just took turns, an hour on, four hours off, around the clock. Somebody always watched Matthew. And the rest of the time, they were free to go about their affairs. Sometimes I watched him, but there were, anyway, there were, there were, it was just a sort of a, around the clock, somebody watches the young one somewhere else, because a child that's less than about five years old can't be put in a classroom. He disrupts everything. So uh, we did that. We had, she had been starting to use Saxon math, and it was logical. And I, I uh, started with the idea that, that since math was the most uh, sort of rigorous thing you would do during the day, you should do it during your freshest hours. So I told them that in the morning they had to do their math before they did anything else. When they woke up and they were fresh, they should do their math. I think now there are much, even more compelling reasons to do it in this way, but it was sort of an accident. So they did their math, and, and then gradually we fell into this thing, which is the uh, method described in our curriculum, which is reading, writing, and arithmetic, which starts in the morning with math, follows by writing something, and then by reading. Uh, after all, the knowledge is in books. People uh, sometimes uh, uh, look at our curriculum and say, well, this is just books, but that's where knowledge is. The essence of education is that there, here are the books, the knowledge, and here's the kid. And the idea is to put one and the other in the most uh, effective manner. And so the, uh, uh, the idea was, but some things require a different form of study than others. Uh, I, have a, I was fortunate to work with a man named Martin Kamen when I was in graduate school. He discovered carbon-14. He was a very, very brilliant man with almost a photographic memory. And Martin had a facility, which I've seen in some other people. Uh, Zachary has it to a certain extent, to read at an incredible rate. And they could read the humanities at incredible speed. The reason the 1911 encyclopedia is on our curriculum, there's a good rational reason, but the, the, the developmental reason was that Zachary just liked the encyclopedia, so he read the whole thing and then decided he'd scan it. Well, that's a sort of unusual activity, but because he has this facility to read at tremendous speed, he does that. But you can't do that in math and science. And Kamen, in his autobiography, describes this. His facilities were much greater than than Zachary's and much greater than, than probably anybody, any of us in this room. But Kamen, who could absorb humanities material with enormous speed, found that it was a, it was a disadvantage to him in his science and his math. And the polls at that time of the congressman showed it would pass. And by the time the dust settled from the fax machines and the phone calls and stuff, there was one vote in the entire U.S. Congress for this bill, the guy that entered it. And they said they got more flack from that than they'd gotten from, uh, uh, well, all the major issues that Congress had had, the big ones, in years. So this is a very strong group of people. Let's see, do you have a place to sit down? Yeah, find, find some place to sit down. Maybe over here, there's a, there's a bench, OK? Thank you. you just came and sit down over on that bench. Um, so there, th these, uh, and a family that will take the time to, to homeschool their children uh, is usually a, a tougher organization that cares a, a lot more about uh, things that are important. But it's becoming, uh, uh, our society, you know, is fragmenting into different parts. And it is literally to the point in our public schools where they're just, they're, they're propaganda machines. They aren't there to teach children. They're there to disseminate the propaganda of one particular political movement and a huge one, but a weak one, because they're turning out uneducated kid, people. Uh, they're turning out kids that can't compete. Uh, so the, uh, the homeschoolers representing now 3%, 3 to 4% of the school children in the country probably represent at least 10 to 15% of the, of the strength of the young people of the country and growing very rapidly. And of course, uh, they also represent the traditional values of the country. So uh, the, the homeschooling is not, I don't think it's just a, a thing people do because they make a decision about education. They make a decision about a lot of different things. Um, it's uh, almost entirely Christian, although not entirely. It's people of other uh, religious persuasions uh, homeschool, but I think they view it largely as the Christians do too. Uh, they want to control the entire environment of their children. And frankly, I, can't ever, I cannot understand. I, I've never been able to. There's some things I don't comprehend at all. 
And one of them is I can't understand having children and then turning them over to the state, which is what people do. They have children, turn them over to the state. The most valuable thing you possibly have in your life is your children, so they turn them over to the state. I'm not giving a lecture on this because you all know this, I'm sure, but uh, uh, the, the uh, public schools have become largely a thing of child abuse. One other statistic which you may not have seen, I think uh, I should credit the man, but I've forgotten the name. Maybe he'll come to me while I'm telling the story. This is in the Wall Street Journal uh, about a study of academics, which I'll talk about next or more. Uh, they were studying academic uh, uh, abilities of homeschooled children versus public school children. And on a battery of tests, ranging from math to history to virtually across the board, the numbers were about the same in all the subjects. Uh, where the public school children were at 50 percentile by definition, the mean for the, on, on the tests were 50 percentile. And within that group, 57 percentile for the whites and around 25 percentile for the blacks and Spanish Americans was the spread in the public schools. The homeschoolers were about 80 percentile. But what was even more striking was that the blacks and Spanish Americans were also 80 percentile in the homeschoolers. It totally wiped out the racial difference. I'm not giving a lecture about biology, but the point is that if there are racial differences, they're very tiny and not really relevant. And if those results have been result re reversed, then I'm sure that homeschooling would be a felony and would be considered child abuse. Uh, and certainly would be considered racism, right? So uh, it's a pretty horrible, uh, the academics are horrible, and it's not just within the country, you know. In science, American children now store last in the Western world in virtually all science and math tests that are given. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, they store, I saw one I thought was very amusing. They, they'd stored last again, 20 out of 20, 20th out of 20 among the 20 Western countries. But they were first in something else. They were first in how good they thought they were at math. Uh, self-esteem, but it's, they, they build self-esteem over nothing, you see. Self-esteem, but the children can't do anything. Another indication, Zachary now, uh, just a vignette, but Zachary's out at Iowa State. He's there because he wants to get a degree in veterinary medicine, and they have a very fine veterinary school, and he's also getting a degree in uh, PhD in organic chemistry. But uh, he's working for the chairman of the chemistry department. The chairman has a rule that he usually does not accept American students as graduate students in his laboratory. They don't work hard enough. There's no work ethic, and they're not well enough educated. He made an exception for Zachary. Uh, Two-thirds of the students are foreign. In Zachary's uh, laboratory, the lab he works in physically every day, he has five partners, other graduate students, all of them are from communist China. And now about two-thirds of all the science graduate students in the United States are foreign. They're not Americans. The American students don't want to work that hard, and they don't have the background to do it anyway. In a competitive environment, they can't compete and get in. In fact, it was kind of <laughs> funny. Not, not funny, but this is Iowa State. We're not talking about some school on the East Coast, the West Coast, or near these. This is the middle, as far as ways you could get from everything. And it's sort of the conservative farm heartland. And it doesn't even have a, it's not like MIT or something with some reputation to draw these people. And uh, the, uh, uh, they, they have a, a rule at Iowa State that every undergraduate must take freshman chemistry. They have 20,000 undergraduates, so they have 5,000 freshman chemistry students to deal with every year. And they need teaching assistance for all these. Uh, and the traditional, the graduate students do the teaching. Uh, and Zachary was in an unusual situation where he uh, uh, wasn't going to be teaching because he had to establish Iowa residency relative to the veterinary school. But they, they, uh, they uh, recruited him as a teacher anyway and made him teach because he had an unusual characteristic. He could speak English <laughs> well. And uh, so many of the graduate students in the graduate school were uh, only partially fluent. Uh, they, they couldn't use them <laughs> as undergraduate freshman teachers. This is a terrible thing for the country as a whole, if you think about it. But that's the way it is. And the uh, education in math and science is a complete disaster in the public schools, total, uh, absolutely total. Um, and the, uh, and it, that comes back, and I could talk about specifically in the curriculum, the academics a little bit more with respect to math and science. Uh, 
I, I could start out the, the barber downtown in Cave Junction. He's not doing it anymore. He got another job. But he's about 35 at this time, and he was giving me a haircut. And I knew him because he'd done, he worked for his father doing some dirt work when we first moved here. He was moved, running a, a backhoe. And he's sitting there, standing there cutting my hair, and he has a normal high school education from Cave Junction Public School. And he said, well, I figure I'm about halfway through college. And if the schools keep deteriorating, by the time I'm 40, I'll have a college education. And who knows, by the time I quit cutting hair, I may have a PhD. <laughs> and and, and uh, he realized this. And this is what he, I didn't say anything about that. He just brought this up and told me the whole story. Uh, and uh, he may almost be right. You know, they're going down. I think they're about two grade levels below what they were when I went to school, maybe worse. Uh, the Zachary and Noah were proud of them. They both skipped two years of college and got their degrees in chemistry in two years. People say, oh my, that's wonderful. The truth is, each of them got a good high school education from the 1950s. And the first two years of college today are merely what they dropped out of school now and they put in college. So, I mean, they did well, and I'm proud of them, but they didn't uh, skip two years of college of the 1940s. They skipped two years of college in the 1990s. Uh, another indicator is in math. John Saxon's first book he wrote was Saxon 5-4. That's the first book he thought you needed to learn math. So he wrote this on his kitchen table. He did a very good job. And now you know this, you know, there's the 5-4 and the 6 and so on. But now there's 1, 2, and 3. Saxon sells a 1 book, a 2 book, a 3 book, and they have that one labeled 5-4, fourth and fifth grade. The reason they have it that way is because it's at about the fourth and fifth grade level of the public schools. And the typical, uh, it, it, people say, well, I get, first they're selling it to schools. He tries to sell it to the public schools. But even for a homeschooler, homeschooler says, well, my child is in the fifth grade and I decided to homeschool him. Please give me an appropriate book. And that book is appropriate for a school. The child is being pulled out of the fifth grade. But the fact is it's appropriate for a seven-year-old. And uh, the one, two, and three our holding pattern, which they put in more recently, it's a holding pattern you put the child in until he's been retarded enough to be at the level of the public school kids. And there's no need for that. Uh, Matthew can tell you he's never been helped. I don't know whether he's ever been helped with a math problem, but not for years. But he's 12, and he started the 5-4 when he was uh, 7. He didn't start school early. He started to learn to read and to do arithmetic. right? That's Algebra 2. You're about half done. So he's about half done with Algebra 2, and he's 12. But that's a normal succession, starting math where you should start it. At, say, about 7. Girls maybe a little earlier, but wherever the child wants to, when they start math, starting with 5-4. The math, of course, now in the public schools, they're teaching that you don't need to learn arithmetic. You don't need to learn to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Use a calculator for this. Uh, and this is insanity. If you can't do these things, you can't think quantitatively. If you can't think quantitatively. Calculators are, um, Aaron uh, got different views from her professors over there at that college. And one of them uh, sent her to a guy because she you know, presents not knowing how to use a calculator. Order from the dark ages, this child must have been, you know, something out of a time warp. So they sent her down the hall to a guy who was going to teach her to use a calculator. And he told her that, oh, this was a wonderful device. This thing is fantastic. It'll do all your math. And also, you put all your physics formulas in, it'll do your physics, put all your chemistry formulas in, it'll do your chemistry, it'll do everything for you. You just learn to push the buttons, you don't need, it, don't need to learn anything. And uh, uh, I told her that was not right, and she says, well, my physics professor is like you. He told me the best thing I could do with my calculator was to throw it on the floor and stomp it to death. <laughs> and, and he was completely right, and this is college physics, because if, <laughs> if you push the buttons, why? That doesn't mean you know any physics. You have to learn to think quantitatively, and you have to learn math to do that. The, uh, uh, the, the, uh, we, I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion or questions about self-teaching, whether you can learn by yourself. And in our, in our experience, it's worked perfectly. I wouldn't change it. In fact, we got into this because of the, of the odd personal circumstance we had, but if that had not happened to us, and we probably wouldn't have if it hadn't happened to us. Laura Lee probably would have stood up at her blackboard and taught the children like a normal teacher throughout their education. But 
I would think it would have been a wonderful blessing had we, for some reason, if she'd still been here and we learned not to use a teacher, because I think it has many advantages. Uh, not just for giving free time and, and making it easier, but tremendous advantages for the child because it uh, learns you, uh, teaches you to, to teach yourself, and that's what you have to do most of your life. And it you know, teaches different thought processes. Uh, you can get into, with anybody, an adult or child, you can get into, you get into sort of syndromes or, 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 or ways that you do things. For example, math uh, can consist of, I'll work the hard ones, and mommy will help me with the easy ones. Or I'll work them all, and the ones I miss, I'll ask for help with. Or when I come to one that I have difficulty with, my older brother will help me, or whatever. And that becomes a way of life. Uh, the uh, uh, Joshua, I don't know whether he, well, I'll tell this story. He says he doesn't remember now, almost. But he was six when his mother died, and girls go a little faster than boys, usually. They grow up a little faster. His, mother, his twin sister was six, but she was a little ahead of him. And he was just learning his tables, his addition, subtraction, multiplication, flashcards. And uh, 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 this, uh, oh, the lady I mentioned, who's a, who had 15 subjects in her, in her school, she wanted to help us. And she looked at us. She said, well, Joshua is the one that needs the help the most because he's just the youngest that's in school. So she'd stop by now and, uh, fairly often and help him with his math. And learning arithmetic uh, became sitting beside a nice lady who would help you with your flashcards. And uh, sort of a social event. After a few months, I said, well, how, has he got him done yet? Well, he's about done with addition, and we're starting subtraction. And I was alarmed, and I took him away from all that and put him at a desk and made himself learn. And it was very painful. He sat at the desk hour after hour after hour. That's not what math is. Math is having this nice lady come in, and, and we have this little social event. And he didn't like it. He does, of course, obeyed, but he sat at the desk. He didn't complain, but he sat there. And uh, he had to do, make so much progress on his arithmetic every day. And he sat there for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. He got up in the morning, sat at his desk, had his meals, and went to bed uh, day after day. And it took quite a few weeks before he stopped staring around the room and got the idea that, well, I guess I'll have to do it myself. There's no other way out of this place. He says he doesn't remember this today. But uh, the, the mindset that I won't have to work the hard ones is uh, uh, entirely different than the mindset that I will work all the problems that are on this page and I'll work them correctly and I have no choice, I will do it. About half of working problems is self-confidence. The other half is mechanics. And Saxon has in his books virtually, now we are five step-by-step -step rules about how to work all those problems. So if you look at the book long enough, it's in there. And uh, the mindset of somebody who actually believes they're going to get help when they can't work the problem is an entirely different thing. And, it, uh, and I think it's a much more useful thing to know that you will work the problems. Nobody will help you. Uh, in problem solving, and problem solving is a big part of education, and it's a big part of early education. It's a tremendous part of science education, but in everything, there are problems to solve. The most uh, spectacular but still exemplary uh, example I know of problem solving is uh, a man I knew in college. His name was Larry Champagne. He was one year ahead of me at Caltech, and he was legendary. He was fantastic in physics. Uh, nobody in the whole campus and Caltech was very good in physics. No, no undergraduate could touch him in problem solving in physics. And Champagne had gained the skill. It wasn't brilliance. He was smart. But he gained the skill in this way. There was a dean at Caltech named Foster Strong. And you'll see the Strong problems are on your curriculum for those who want to have the experience. They're for, for advanced students. But Strong had uh, he'd gone to Caltech to get a PhD and, and managed not to get it. He couldn't, wasn't good enough. He couldn't get his PhD, but he stayed on as administrator and became a dean of students. And he taught physics. And he collected from the examinations the physics problems that they put on the exam so nobody could get them all right, no matter how good they were. They're all Newtonian mechanics. They're all worked with F equals MA, just Newton's three laws. You need nothing else. But they are bizarre. They're, I mean, they're t 
twists to every one. They're different. You know, there are pulleys going in every direction, and sliding planes, and all kinds of stuff. And you have to stare at them a long time to see the way to work the problem, even though there's nothing behind the problem except very, very simple physics. And uh, he collected, I forget how many there are, 150, 167, something like this. He collected these. And when you were a freshman, they handed you these problems and said, if you have any spare time, enjoy yourself. And the typical student would work half a dozen and get busy with other things and have trouble with some of them. And they were just, they were around, but they were almost a subject of amusement because nobody had time to work all those problems and they were hard. But Champagne took it seriously. When he was a freshman, he picked up strong problem number one. And he looked at it and he couldn't figure out how to work it. So he carried it around his head and he thought about it and he fell asleep thinking about it and he sat on the floor of his room thinking about it and whenever he had a few moments he thought about it and it took him a couple of weeks to find it and he finally worked it by himself. He figured it out. So then he picked out strong problem number two and he did the same thing. Just puzzled at it, accepted no help, worked at it, fiddled with it, probably took a couple of weeks on that one. I don't know what the timing was. But as time passed they got easier and easier and he finally worked them all. And from then on, he never saw a physics problem he couldn't work. He learned how to solve problems. And he learned the self-confidence to know that there was no physics problem he couldn't work. <laughs> and uh, for the mere mortals among us, who's not trying to work strong problems, but just math problems, the same thing holds. Uh, it can be, if you say, uh, I got a, and Matthew has heard this a few times, but not very often, maybe once a year now, because he never asked the question. You say, oh, this problem, I can't work this problem. And you say, well, I uh, guess you'll just have to work on it till you get it. <laughs> and it could take a long time. Eventually, we'll get it. The, the, uh, uh, the self-teaching of math in this way teaches. And I learned its, I, I first saw its strength. It, we were doing it just because that's the way it had to be. I didn't have any time to teach him how to work math problems. But we got done with the math. Zachary got done with the math. And now what do you do? He's uh, at that point. 16 maybe, gets done with the Saxon calculus, 17, uh, maybe it was 17. The older children got done with their math later because they started this process at a later age. And Bethany's the earliest, she got done with her calculus at 14. But they got done, and then the question is, what do I give Zachary? I'm out of math books. And so I looked around and I, had, I got a physics book, the freshman physics book from Caltech. And it's a hard physics book and it was not intended to be used in this way, it's intended that there'll be lecture, three lectures a week, instruction, and so forth. I handed it to him, and he just started working the problems and going right through it. it took longer for problem. He he had gotten the, used to the idea that he could work problems, and his he didn't know any better. He just kept working them. <laughs> and the self-teaching of the math, starting with adding, which was trivial, and going up through the Saxon calculus got his problem solving and his self-confidence good enough that he went right into it. And Noah did the same thing and it, it works that way. So it's, uh, I think the self-teaching has, that's an advantage that you don't have if you have a teacher who will help you. Uh, in selection of the books uh, that we have, this curriculum is kind of a stealth curriculum in a way that uh, there aren't very many overtly Christian books on there, but if you look at the autobiographies that we've selected, you'll probably find they're all Christian men, 